Number one, um, with regard to focusing our clinical attention on the creeper, um, he, he is, and the myth, the urban legend is that he um, feeds, I think it's every 23 years for 23 days, mm -hmm. so that uh, his urban legend can continue. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned antisocial personality disorder, and even though our first rule of Right club is that you don't talk about antisocial personality disorder. I think it's okay if we do today because there's a step beyond the, the casual interpretation of this being a blatant disregard for and violation of others' rights because of the cannibalism. And in a way, what we see here is the most, arguably, the most vile form of disregard. I mean, this is the Hannibal Lecter of antisocial personality. So, uh, at least to make that teaching point, discussing the antisocial personality, I think, is in fair play today. Um, you also mentioned about this perhaps being about eating disorders, and you wouldn't be too far off. I think I mentioned this before, but it's worth re-mentioning. That previous to the DSM-5, the eating disorders were really a group of dis conditions, bulimia and anorexia, that had little to do with eating. I mean, eating behavior or maladaptive eating behavior was how these conditions manifest in clinical practice, in inventory care settings, in inpatient hospitals. But the root cause has nothing to do with eating. So they're misnomers. What anorexia and bulimia had in common was that they were both self-image disturbances and clinically significant self-image disorders. That was the real idea. Having said that, um, in 2013, with the publication of the DSM-5, the American Psychiatric Association changed the title of the illness, or excuse me, changed the title of the chapter to the Eating and Feeding Disorders and included Binge Eating Disorder, which separates from bulimia in that it is not a self-image disturbance guiding the behavior. So they totally undid what I, what I had considered to be the most important aspect of the chapter, which to, is to remind clinicians that eating disorders have nothing to do with eating, because now they kind of do, because of the 2013 revision. All right, so, and then why not cannibalism? I mean, if we're gonna go there, the next step is, I think, recognizing the obvious, that if it has nothing to do with self-image, but everything now to do with disordered eating, and eating is actually the focus of clinical attention and not the manifestation of an underlying problem, then why not cannibalism? Who would ignore cannibalism or say that's normal? Right, we wouldn't. So I think that's fair game. And it's at least it allows us to kind of go back and historically review the evolution of the DSM and its inclusion of binge eating disorder in the eating and feeding disorder chapters of the DSM-5. Right, so I think that's noteworthy. You, you, you gotta know that for your exam. What else? He's kind of along the same lines of self-image, like body dysmorphic disorder, where he, he thinks that he is, he's lacking something, so therefore that's what leads him to go and feed, take their body parts. Yeah, well, I mean, certainly if the creeper came to clinical attention, if he made an appointment with you, <laughs> And said, you know, I've got this, I've got this issue. Uh, I think one of the things the clinician might might want to know about is what is motivating the behavior to catabolize. And if it's a, if it's along the lines of blatant disregard, I mean, we have a we have a Hannibal Lecter sitting in front of you. However, if it's to 
um, sustain life, I, I, I'd be concerned maybe of a delusional disorder, grandiose type. But then again, um, if it's because of a self-image disturbance, um, then maybe even body dysmorphic disorder. Right? Um, I think in clinical practice, and this might come up in shelf exams as well, but certainly in clinical practice with regard to a clinical pearl, the differentiation between a body dysmorphic disorder and eating disorder um, is warranted. Body dysmorphic disorder is a preoccupation with some imagined physical defect in appearance. While the eating disorders, absent or at, at the exclusion of binge eating disorder, is a preoccupation with some imagined defect in appearance, specifically body image. So they're, they're very closely connected. That is the eating disorders, SANS, binge eating disorder, and body dysmorphic disorder. Maybe he does have some body dysmorphic in the sense that he's attractive to look more like a human, so maybe he is insecure about how he looks. Yeah, again, that's a, that's a fair question. I, when, he, when, he come, when he comes to see you, please feel free to ask. <laughs> I think that's a very fair question. I also, uh, sure. it also reminded me of like, I feel like if you're back there were cases Florida of people doing bath salts and like eating people's faces. Um, I actually had a friend in high school who was killed by her boyfriend on bath salts, and it was like a very like violent kind of like I think eating her was part of it. Um, and that just really reminded me of like that. Um, yeah. So that brings up a couple that one um, I, I think is certainly intended. The other one I'm sure I'm not sure if you intended. Uh, the one that might be intended is to make sure that whatever we're describing here is not the direct and physio physiologic effect of a substance. Uh, and, I, and bath salts, I think, is very fair to bring up here because of the aggressive nature with which people do atrophy under the influence. Right. So the um, mephedrone is a synthetic stimulant, which will give you all the signs and symptoms of stimulant intoxication, but it also has a PCP-like effect with regard to the NMDA receptor and being uh, or manifesting with extreme aggressiveness and impulsivity, uh, which of course we see in this movie. By the way, what other movie metaphorically demonstrates that PCP-like effect? Whether we say it's due to PCP, PCP intoxication or um, methadrone, bath salts, PCP-like effect, another movie where we see just a total annihilation. Sci-fi, classic. Is it possible it? It, um, yeah, it's, it's hard to say no. That's not the one I was thinking of, though. I don't know, like the, the Hulk? The Hulk, um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, unmarvel. The Terminator. Uh, anybody here not see The Terminator? Fess up. Oh, I've never seen it. I saw it a very long time ago, to be fair. <laughs> there, there is a uh, scene in the police department that is hallmarked by the tagline of this movie. Anybody want to share the tagline of The Terminator? I'll be back. <laughs> right? I mean, that, that tagline hallmarks a very important scene in this film. Because when Arnold Schwarzenegger's character goes to the clerk, the lieutenant, and asks <coughs> for Sarah Connor, they say, she's in the back right now, she'll, she'll be a while, buddy. And that's when he says, I'll be back. Um, quick tangent. Sarah and Reese are meeting with the detective and a psychologist. And this, again, I know in Fright Club, we do not talk about shared psychotic disorder, but Right now, I'm going to talk about shared psychotic disorder because what happens in that scene is incredibly telling. We see Reese screaming at them, and at a point, they have to separate and make sure that he actually goes to a different room with a psychologist. That tells you that the PD identified that Reese has the primary condition, and Sarah, Sarah Connor, is the one who is quote unquote normal and is beginning to incorporate the delusion of the primary patient. His name is Reese. Once separated, she tells the detective, she gains instant insight. You know, I know it sounds crazy. 
right? And, you know, as I say it out loud, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. I, I know the way this sounds, but one thing that does bother me, I actually saw him put his fist right through a windshield. Any guess, or does anybody remember, what the next line out of the detective, detective's mouth is? Probably on PCP. So he says it right there. As soon as he says it, what happens? Arnold Schwarzenegger drives his car right through the wall of the precinct and kills everybody inside. With, with one exception, or two exceptions, of course. Reese escapes with Sarah Connor. Right? Now, it's interesting that before Arnold comes in, or while Arnold comes in, we do look at Reese with these psychologists. And he is bouncing off the walls, screaming at him. So clearly, separating the two re resolves symptoms in one and leaves the other symptoms unresolved, back in, in the case of Reese. So it's a very nice depiction of shared psychosis, right? Even though we're not allowed to talk about it. There is a scene in, the reason why I went into that tangent, there is a scene in this movie which is almost exactly the same, where we have our two protagonists, they're not named Reese or Sarah, but we have two protagonists in a police station, and we see a violent creeper penetrate the police station and kill everybody inside. Right? It's a, it, uh, to watch those two scenes back to back is eerie. Right? I'm talking about the Terminator connecting now with Jeepers Creepers. Is there any way Jeepers Creepers can be about bath salts or even PC? Now, um, if you look at the DSM with regard to PCP intoxication, and oh, by the way, there's no such thing as PCP withdrawal. PCP, uh, PCP intoxication is the only thing you have to recognize on exams. The behavioral components of which are right out of the film, whether or not you choose to watch the police scene in The Terminator or Deeper Screepers. Rewatch that and you'll never miss PCP intoxication is the single best answer on an exam. There is also physiologic sequelae of acute PCP intoxication beyond behavioral. If you want to remember those, the acronym is Terminator. And if you just rearrange them, it does spell out Creeper. So I'll post both on Instagram later. So whatever, whatever one you think is easier to remember, go with it. But they're going to be the physiologic signs of acute PCP intoxication. In either case, there are significant eye findings, which is really interesting because both of these creatures have significant eye Hollywood stuff going on. Uh, it's right there in the plot of Jeepers Creepers, spoiler alert, and the eyes of the Terminator are very telling as well, especially when he gets his face ripped off and you actually see the robotics, right? That reminds us to review those acute intoxication syndromes that have nystagmus as a presenting sign or a clinical finding. There are four intoxication syndromes, one being PCP. What are the other three that will come up on your exam? Ketamine. Ketamine. Well, ketamine is PCP. As no. far as as far as we're concerned, in terms of mechanism of action, yes. Right. Still, we still need three more though. Sometimes, like orange juice and alcohol. Um. Yes, intoxication, we're going to test intoxication syndromes oh. specifically. But you're right, yeah. And alcohol. Alcohol is definitely one of them, yeah. And if alcohol can do it, what else can do it? That's it. Good. So now you have three of the four. One more. Benzos can do it, can barbiturates do it? Same thing, yeah. <laughs> Set of hypnotics can do it. Cocaine will not do it. So when you see nystagmus listed in your clinical vignette, you know that you can go down into your answer set and cross everything out other than alcohol, sedative hypnotics, PCP slash ketamine, and inhalants. Right. And depending on, of course, related signs and symptoms that you provide in your clinical vignette, one of those four will be your single best answer. All right, so methadrone, um, yes, but if you're really focused, pardon the pun, on the eye as maybe being metaphorical, me methadrone or bath salts slash synthetic stimulants would fall lower on your list if you're thinking that this has to do with my, my, uh, nystagmus, metaphorically or symbolically. Uh, PCP will 
jump off the list there. If we're discussing the behavioral change that we see in the creeper, in addition to the direct and physiologic effect of a substance, what else must a clinician always investigate and rule out? There's two things that any psychiatrist has to definitively rule out before they rule in a mental disorder. One is substance related, what's the other one? Due to the direct and physiologic effect of an underlying medical condition. Anything there? Why dementia? Uh, if you're talking aggression, maybe something like a frontotemporal dementia. So you're worried about, you're worried about the, um, the creature's frontal lobe? Yes. Okay, go with that. Because like an MDA receptor encephalitis, so, like a schizophrenia. So again, um, uh, is there any, well, first of all, what is the, what are the potential etiologies of encephalitis or encephalopathy? Like a perineoplastic. anything else? Can we talk about the, uh, the workup of delirium in general? What tests to consider? ADUA, SSRI. What's the acronym? Vitamins. Right. You're all right. There's an easier way of categorizing these, right? We, we, uh, we talked about what tragedy to watch. It's not cheaper creepers. Shakespeare's Macbeth. Because I Heart Lady Macbeth gives you the uh, actual diagnostic workup of um, delirium or encephalopathy using those two clinical terms interchangeably here. I Heart Lady Macbeth. There's one called yaws, right? The Y in lady is yaws, Y A W S, and it is a um, Central and South American spirochete infection which then would lead the clinician to consider other infective or infiltrative causes, especially if the individual is demonstrating aggressive behavior that may have a predilection for the frontal lobe, which is your point. Is there anything else that you have to consider here specifically? What else has predilection for the frontal lobe in terms of infection or infiltrative? How do you get that? Like a prion disease that we name, it can either be inherited or it can be eaten like in raw meat. Raw meat, more specific? Like raw brain. Raw brain, more specific, and what else? Like cow brain, or I mean it happens in cows. So it's two organs that you're worried about, right? Um, so this is, a, this is a prion disease, and an individual can have it uh, acquired through the ingestion of two organs. One, and both these come up in exams, one is the brain. Is it like the heart? Nope. Try to look it up. Liver? Nope. Muscle? Sorry? Muscle? Nope. Okay. Wait, where is it? The brain and like nerve tissue? And nope. Brain? We got brain. We got one of the two. Lung mouth? Lung mouth. Lung mouth. Stomach. Stomach mouth. No. Bronze? Did you guys watch Cheaper Scrapers? The eyes. Yeah. <laughs> the eyes, right? Even people who have undergone corneal transplant are at risk. Really? Was up on exam, so watch that. Watch for that. Part of the pot. All right. So we've got we've got a, a character that is very aggressive. It is uh, certainly agitated. Is assaultive. And again, th those adjectives come right out of the DSM descriptive of acute PCP intoxication. And since we have to first rule out the direct and physiologic effects of a substance as either contributing to or even causing the behavior, certainly PCP intoxication has to be in our differential diagnosis, right? Uh, in addition to that, uh, if we are to investigate and hypothetically, if we did rule out substance-induced, let's say psychosis slash agitation, then due to a general or another medical condition would be next up. And if we're thinking of conditions 
medical slash neurological conditions that might affect the frontal lobe, Crucible Jakob, um, CJ disease, the acquired form can be through the ingestion of eyes, as well as brains. So um, that's certainly going to be a differential here. What else about the creeper? So what I've mentioned to you before, with regard to why this, this film, I think, might be arguably the strongest in reviewing the DSM hierarchy and how a clinician should go about evaluating mental disorders is because of the fact that I think there are subversive messages with regard to substance use as well as medical conditions that one would have to consider as influencing the creeper's behavior. That's the reason why. And I don't think many people watching this movie would, have, would think along those lines. Mm -hmm. And especially when you pair this in a double feature with The Terminator, those two, those two scenes um, that are set to the police station are unmistakably, I think, a duplicate. And The Terminator, again, uh, is a great clip. At least that one scene is a great clip to watch, to review the behavioral manifestations of acute PCP intoxication as is the police station scene in The Creeper with the, the acronym Terminator providing us the signs and symptoms of uh, physiologic sequelae of acute PCP intoxication. And again, remember, no, no PCP withdrawal and no ketamine withdrawal, no such thing. What else we got? Half an hour to lunch. The lady at the end, um, she was having like visions of what would happen to them, so that kind of suggests like a psychosis. And she's having like these like premonitions she thinks she's having. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's uh, obviously it's a little eerie because they're they're right on target. Um, so, <laughs> but of course, you know, if she presented to clinical care. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily think that. Uh, I, I would think that a clinician would instantly go to the idea that she might be suffering from some form of psychosis. Um, however, um, we have to keep an open mind, and certainly when information is presented that allows us to um, refute our initial or provisional uh, diagnosis, the clinician has to adapt. And the fact that she's right, right here is, is a little scary. Um, that said, what may influence the clinician with regard to being flexible in these types of situations? Cultural beliefs? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, um, that's important to recognize because Jeepers Creepers happens to be an urban legend. Oh, by the way, you're, you're, and it, just, it just reoccurred to me. Um, having made mention of bath salts and their prevalence in Florida, um, I, again, it's a, it's a one in 50 chance, but this film is set in Florida. And so, I mean, just, just again, another weird coincidence. But um, this movie is actually inspired by a real, well, quote unquote, real life urban legend, a little bit of oxymoron. I believe its name is uh, Spring Heel Jack. Uh, which is prevalent in, in Great Britain, Scotland, and England. And so, um, to the extent that urban legends themselves are great examples, simple examples of um, culturally sanctioned beliefs, the idea of something being culturally sanctioned should be in the back, if not the forefront, of a clinician's mind when remaining flexible and hearing information that perhaps is not in our textbooks. So there's a nice parallel between how you would approach that particular character clinically and the movie she's in itself based on an urban legend, which reminds us about being culturally sensitive and behaviors that may be culturally sanctioned. Spring Hill Jack. What else? Over here, see Hellraiser. No. 
So I, I initially tweeted to watch it. I, 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 I don't think I deleted the tweet, but I, I retweeted a different movie in the 12 rest. Um, anybody know about Hellraiser? Anybody ever hear of it before? So it's a classic 80s slasher film. Right, probably, I mean, easily ranked in the top five slasher films in the 80s. And it's about a group of creatures called the Cenobites who are conjured by a key in the form of a box, otherwise referred to as the Lamarchan configuration. Solve the puzzle, open a doorway from hell, another dimension. And um, it's a story about who I think is the main character, Frank Cotton, who is in search for this legendary box. And the reason why he's in search of it is very telling. It's because in his current state of consciousness, he can no longer derive any sexual pleasure. That is, everything that he's tried and tried again and has repeated has resulted in a form of tolerance. And he can no longer engage in any kind of sexual activity and find gratification. So it actually gets to this idea of sex addiction, where you have to continually um, uh, increase the dose, so to speak, to get the same effect. He has a ceiling on this now. So the only way he can derive sexual pleasure is by opening up another dimension. It tells you how messed up this character is. Because he's done things that anybody in this room would never even think of. As a matter of fact, it probably gets me a little anxious that in an academic setting, we're even bringing up topics like this. Frank Cotton has done them. And he's done them to the extent that they no longer provide that same effect. That's how deplorable the character is. He is arguably the most deplorable character ever created in fiction. Okay. So that's that's what this movie is about. Okay. And that's that's one of the, I think, the main themes I would have liked you to draw from it if I had a sign. Why am I bringing this up in the context of Jeepers Creepers? A little, little bit of a broader context or a broader question, open-ended question. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about pertaining to this movie? I don't know, the only thing related to like kind of what you were saying that struck me watching it was like, it seemed kind of fetishy. Like they were naked and like, I was surprised that that was like in a horror movie. It was like, like there was some other, like it wasn't like a sexual, like, This morning, I, I actually did uh, create a Word document about um, uh, just an overall advisory of entering the clerkship. It occurred, it, it occurred to me that I probably should put one up on AMP <laughs> for, for all to see. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? So I'm kind of continuing with that theme. Uh, I saw there is a theory that there was some themes of incest between the brother and sister, like adding on to their sexual thing, because of the, I guess one of the ways was, for example, the phone call, she kept getting very much in his face, and then even though he tried to pull back, she kept insisting. So the theory was that the whole thing was just a very deep dive into the male characters, because attraction to his sister. Okay, anybody? Agree, disagree. So, 
I mentioned this before that I've got about 10, maybe as much as a dozen experiences having attended a movie that due to no fault or influence of the movie itself, but other things that have happened had made the movie experience to me absolutely memorable, if not weird, right? And, and this movie's one of them. So when this movie premieres, um, I'm late to getting to my seat. I'm not gonna get into the reasons why whose fault it was, it wasn't mine. But I'm late getting into my seat, and I settle in uh, at or around about 10 minutes into the, into the movie. And what that means, and I went back and I actually, obviously I've looked at this movie more than one time. I've watched this movie more than once. And I certainly went and kind of did the deep dive and nerded out in looking at the timestamps of this. And there are two occasions within the first 10 minutes where Derry refers to Trish as big sis or Trish, little brother to Derry. And that's established in the beginning of the movie when they're in that car. And that's prior to the creeper's truck pulling up behind them. After 10 minutes, and I actually think it's like 9 minutes, 20 seconds to be exact, but if you miss the first 10 minutes, I'm going to round up. The only other time the parents are mentioned, they're mentioned generically. As parents, not our parents. There's nothing in the dialogue to suggest that they're siblings. So when the word mom is mentioned, it isn't a possessive. It isn't or it doesn't have anything to do with who's talking, much less the other person in the room and who would have a sibling relationship otherwise established. That's absent. The bottom line is that if you missed the first 10 minutes of this film, you missed any explicit evidence that Darry and Trish are brother and sister. And I could tell you that as someone who, when I first watched this movie, um, and missing the first 10 minutes, I went into this movie the same way a, an investigator goes into research blinded. I was not given any explicit, explicit message, and I had to draw everything from what I was seeing as a blinded reviewer, if you will. And let me tell you, the sexual tension between brother and sis is through the darn roof. I was shocked at the end of the movie to find out that they were brother and sister. Because the whole time I had thought they were boyfriend and girlfriend driving back from college. There are scenes where he's going through the laundry. He, there are scenes where he's picking up her laundry. There are scenes at the telephone. There are scenes where he sounds like he's jealous of the good looking state trooper, where he turns to her and says, Don't tell me you like him. All of that's interpreted objectively when you're not biased into knowing that they're brother and sister. The way he talks to his sister is inappropriate. It's just amazing. And when you understand that, if you really tap into that, it totally twists what this movie is really about. So I, I don't know where you found that online, but I'm absolutely in agreement with that. So in preparing, in terms of the points I wanted to talk about today, and reviewing, uh, reviewing this on the internet, I did come across an interview with the director, who said that the original script had them as friends, and only as friends. But because he was concerned that the sexual tension would be, would be too great between the characters, um, a late edit was to make them brother and sister. So the editor got it. The, other, the editor understood <laughs> that this was going to be a problem, and went so far as to making sure that the script dictated otherwise. The problem is, is that if you miss this in the first 10 minutes, you miss the editor's uh, um, you know, heads up in terms of setting the scenes to come. And the first time I saw this movie is exactly what happened. Yeah. Uh, I had no clue that Derry and Trish were brother and sister, and therefore, again, as a blinded reviewer, you could easily tap into what was really going on between brother and sister. And it really makes you revisit why the creeper took his eyes. I mean, it probably started out with a little peeping. And this gets to the Cenobites. Because as you watch this movie, now I'm going to flip to Hellraiser. Um, when you understand 
that what Frank Cotton is doing is against every pro-social norm. I mean, he rapes his brother's fiance on their bed, on their wedding dress, the morning of the wedding. I mean, you don't get more vile than exactly, right? And that doesn't do it for him. He still leaves her because he, he just isn't satisfied. Right? Ultimately, it's got to, again, open up another dimension where pain and pleasure are one, opening up different parts of his brain so he can actually experience something and feel something. The Cenobites are among the creepiest, scariest slashers ever created. So, um, and there's some gore, at least 80s gore, when looking at this movie, but once you understand their role in society and in a culture, they flip from a monster, or a group of monsters, into a necessary part of a culture to establish and keep the social norm and punish those who violate it. So they turn out to be gruesome and bad to needed and good. And my perspective is so does the creeper. There's one creeper in this movie, and it isn't the guy with the suit who's eating the eyes. The creeper is little brother. The real creeper. And this, this movie is about incest, and it's about paraphilia, and it's about an urban legend of what will happen to you if you disobey cultural, cultural norms. The creeper will get you. That kind of goes in line with like the creeper scares you to see what you fear, and then he like senses what's like to take about you. Like he like sniffs both of them to like identify what was like the part of them he wanted, and then he like ends up going with the brother's eyes. So that is totally in line with what you're saying. Yeah. Remember the diner scene too. I mean, before Darry starts picking up that locker, which again is creepy to me when they're watching. Everything off. Hands off man. <laughs> The waitress describes what she saw. She never actually describes any features that would allow the viewer to separate the creeper from Darren. Mm -hmm. If you look at that, and if you go into the scene and think to yourself, you know what, I'm gonna pretend she saw Darry. When then she goes through that dialogue, she describes Darry. Exactly, yeah. he was sniffing her clothes, right? Like, and then the, the chief goes into even more detail about it. He was sniffing it like he was really enjoying it. Freaking Darry, man. <laughs> right? Because I remember watching the movie for the first time, and I thought, I, I thought she was describing the creeper, which, again, any normal person sitting in the movie theater would. But my reaction was, boy, the creeper sounds a lot like her brother. Right? That, that, that's where my mind went, because I was still not getting over the fact. And that was around the film scene, too, when they were in the diner. So I was quickly, you know, getting grossed out by this guy. Uh, which again, which is, now the reason why I wanted you to watch In the Tall Grass, and again, I was going back and forth between Hellraiser and In the Tall Grass, because in one context, you have a movie called Hellraiser that focuses on the monster turned pro-social norm, the keeper of the cultural norm. The other movie, The Tall Grass, focuses on the actual characters that are persecuted by the monster. Because in The Tall Grass, we, we see that the, set, the setting is the same, tall grass, right, off a lonely, you know, um, isolated road, mm -hmm. right, with a church with a black crow. I mean, same exact tropes in place. But in the, when, so I'm watching In the Tall Grass, and I'm thinking to myself, man, it sounds like Keepers Creepers. And I'm wondering if now, because now I've already got this conspiracy theory about Keepers Creepers, and I'm watching, this is 2019, In the Tall Grass, I think it's on Netflix, that it, that it premieres, and I'm watching this, and I instantly think, I wonder if there's stuff going on now between brother and sister, and of all things, it is written in the script that there is. Because you have a character telling, you know, your brother loves you too much or your brother shouldn't love you in that way. I was like, oh man, somebody actually saw Jeepers Creepers and decided to take it one step further, make it explicit. So that's the reason why I think there's an Easter egg in the, in the tall grass that gives you the hidden agenda in Jeepers Creepers. That's why I should watch it. 
Again, you can watch either movie. If you want to watch Hellraiser, you'll see another hidden Easter egg. It's a little bit redundant. But now focused on the monster and not the main characters, the antagonist, not the protagonist. It depends on which way you want to go. The other thing, anybody here um, like Greek myth? Enjoy Greek mythology? Uh, anybody know what the Furies are? Other than being badass? So fur Furies are women in Greece that literally tear you apart if you violate social norms. Right? And they, 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 they're ravaging. You, you, you do not want to get on the, the, the bad side or the wrong side of the Furies. So um, the Furies, I think, are highlighted best in the Oresteia, which is a trilogy, right? The, the first book of which, um, and I, I always pronounce his name wrong, it's Aeschylus or something along those lines. So excuse me if I don't know the Greek author, uh, but I always mispronounce his name. But the first book of the Oresteia focuses on Agamemnon's return from the Trojan War. And although he comes back with his girlfriend, it is wrong for his wife, Cleonatra, to have a boyfriend. Right? That's just Greek culture at the time, and very similar to culture, cultures throughout, even over time. But that's what's established here in ancient Greece. What happens is that Cleonatra plots to kill and assassinate her husband, and does so. Uh, and even though um, it's, it's largely untold, um, she kills him by stabbing him. And oh, by the way, in Hellraiser, the book, The Hellbound Heart, uh, we have the same exact thing happen. Right? So there's a nice parallel there between a Greek myth, a Greek tragedy, the Aristia and Hellraiser. And um, upon killing him, she violates a social norm. The son, Orestes, has to step up. And he does so by killing his mother in vengeance. So in one respect, he did the right thing. Unfortunately, the Furies now are after his ass. So that's the focus of the second book that evolves to the third part of the trilogy. I believe it's called the Eumenides, where it focuses primarily on the, Thori, uh, the Furies and the court case where Athena, uh, the uh, patron god of Greece, is the um, defense counsel for Orestes. And they basically settle out of court. Orestes is allowed to actually uh, plea and avoid the death penalty, basically. But in exchange, the Furies get their names changed to the, you know, you, you, I, think it's, I think it's pronounced humanities. And their robes are changed from black to red. The Furies in Greek literature are the Cenobites in Clive Barker's uh, universe. Okay, they're the exact same thing. It's remarkable. So if you enjoy Greek myth and if you enjoy slasher films, check out Hellraiser, now that you've watched Jeepers Creepers, and then read the Aristide. It's a short read. It's not that it's not long of a read. And it would be remarkable on how an 80s, a classic 80s slasher film is basically the retelling of a Greek tragedy. It's a pretty, it's a pretty cool one too. All right, anything else with regard to Jeepers Creepers? All right, we'll leave it here. All right, so that, uh, that, that'll be it. So we'll stop here. Um,